Now, auxiliary liver transplant is um, a, a passionate subject for me. I've been interested in this for 20 years now, I think. I've done some of the earliest of the liver transplants. And for those of you who don't know much about it, I think it's, it's, it's a very exciting operation, but um, if you look at a definition of a good operation, it wouldn't qualify as a good operation. The reason for that is a good operation is something which should be reproducible by most reasonable surgeons. And uh, for over 20 years, people have said that this is a difficult operation or the results have not been good. I think one of the reasons, and I will, I will actually talk about some of the reasons why it was difficult, and we struggled just like other people in the beginning, but um, we have come to a different situation now because you need to understand disease processes to be able to apply this operation for the right patient. Not everyone would be suitable for it. First of all, what is auxiliary liver transplant? Auxiliary liver transplant is a situation where you do not remove the whole of the patient's liver. You keep some of patient's liver and then give them a significant amount of liver depending on the disease for which you are transplanting because auxiliary liver transplant is indicated for two conditions. One is acute liver failure, which we are going to talk about, and the other is metabolic liver disease. Some metabolic liver diseases require very little liver. Crigler-Najjar syndrome is an example. You put 15% of liver you will correct the underlying metabolic liver disease. And it's a perfect operation for something like Crigler-Najjar syndrome. Whereas with acute liver failure, you need a large volume of liver for a patient to recover from acute liver failure, and therefore you need large amount of liver, and you couldn't do a left lateral segmentectomy. And that's a pictorial representation, really. We had a, we had a fellow who's a locum consultant now called Hector Wilkin Melendez. This is, doesn't have a battery, I'm afraid. Is that a one battery which works? Oh, very good. Yeah, where the, the native liver is left behind and you put an auxiliary graft. And the indication is acute liver failure, which is the most common and probably the most exciting indication. And what happens when you do an auxiliary liver graft? You get a patient survival because uh, they've got enough liver mass for them to survive. And then you wait for native liver that you have left behind, the liver that you have left behind to recover. And once they recover, you can aim to withdraw immunosuppression. And this is actually more important in our country than any other part of the world because withdrawal of immunosuppression is such an attractive option in our country and it will reduce the cost. I mean, in the Western world, you will talk about long-term complications of immunosuppression and therefore withdrawal of immunosuppression is a great option for patients in our country Cost is a major issue, and therefore withdrawal of immunosuppression is a very important option in our country. I'm immediately going to go into the pathology of acute liver failure. We recognize, we talked about it, at least the two wide acute liver failures that you see, the hyperacutes where patients come into hospital and they are dead within three days to seven days. And the other ones who linger around in your hospital with high INRs, grade two encephalopathy or grade three encephalopathy, and then they slowly die, and usually they die of sepsis rather than liver failure itself. Their INRs don't go high until they actually become septic and their encephalopathy gets worse. So this is a classical example of a hyperacute liver failure. I've been using this picture for many, many years, and I've even seen other people use this picture in their talks. So this is a paracetamol overdose, a very pale-looking liver, not collapsed, Classically, people say acute liver failure livers are collapsed. Not collapsed because it doesn't have enough time to collapse, really, in the hyperacute phase. And the other one you see is a subacute liver, which is also pale. And if you take a biopsy in any of these areas, you would have less than 5% surviving hepatocytes. And this is collapsed. You can see how small the liver is. But you also see that there are regenerating nodules there. These, this is not a cirrhotic liver. These are regenerating nodules. And when we saw something like that in the early phase, we were quite excited about it because we thought this patient fulfills criteria for transplantation. If you don't transplant, most of them would die of sepsis, really. Uh, every, a lot of people have mentioned that during their talks as well. And we have regenerating nodules. So this condition has got a potential to regenerate. 
So why don't we do an auxiliary? It, sh it seems a big shame to take away a liver which is attempting to regenerate. So those are the surgeons who have done subacute liver failure that commonly see surface nodules in these livers which are really regenerative nodules. So the first mistake we did was to think that this is better and that the hyperacutes are worse. And the hyperacutes also have toxic liver syndrome because most of the liver is dead and their hemodynamics are very rocky during the operation and in the post-operative period. And we thought leaving a hyperacute liver is actually harmful to the patient and potentially might kill the patient. So we thought this is the best indication for auxiliary liver transplant. And another example, just to see how you get, these are greenish, they're not black, they're greenish regenerative nodule because in a subacute liver failure, the only part of the liver that is working is the regenerating nodules and bile excretion is one of the most important function of liver cells and therefore they get very cholestatic. These cells get cholestatic. This is actually not a picture of acute liver failure. This is a paras this is the Krigler Najjar syndrome. Just to show you an example of doing a left lateral segment auxiliary. So I'm going to go into the history of it. When people did auxiliary liver transplant, they thought the easiest thing to do is to do a left lateral segment auxiliary. I mean, this is, this is common sense, isn't it? You don't have to do a big hepatectomy. You do a left or a left lateral segmentectomy and then actually expose the cava. In the early days, we even did heterotopic auxiliary. This is an autotopic auxiliary because you remove the left lobe and then replace it with the left lobe. In the initial stages, people do, did heterotopic auxiliary and they were disasters, absolute disasters. The first two cases I did were actually heterotopic auxiliaries and they were absolute disasters. The reason for that is there is no space for the liver to really when it's regenerating. So this is an example of a left lateral segment auxiliary. This is an example of a whole left lobe auxiliary. And then this is an example of a right lobe auxiliary. So there are different ways of doing auxiliary and there are specific indications every time for the different, different levels. So before I go into the results of auxiliary liver transplant, and one of the things I'd like, you to, like to say is we probably, and I've done most of the auxiliaries in Kings, have the biggest experience in the world and that again is we have more than half the experience of the world. We have done probably about 70 auxiliary liver transplant for acute liver failure and probably about 25 for, for metabolic liver disease. The whole world has done less than really 150 auxiliary liver transplants. So I'm talking with a lot of experience in this field. So if you look at the first publication which came out, and I think about uh, 10 or 12 of these patients were our own patients, it was a very clear conclusion which came out. And this is a European publication, 42 patients from 12 European centers. You can see each one have contributed really very little. One year survival for auxiliary liver transplant was only 53%. So if you look at this data, you wouldn't offer auxiliary liver transplant. But actually, historically, if you look at it, if you look at registry data for survival for acute liver failure, it wouldn't be more than 60%. So the OLT for the same period for the, for the European register was only 52%. So it's not that different. And when you did an orthotopic auxiliary, I told you about the heterotopic auxiliary, it was 33% versus 61%. And the most important was when they survived, 65%, two-thirds of the patient could be taken off immunosuppression. So this was a very important study. And the other thing that we found was complete recovery was seen in two groups, children and the hyperacute liver failure. So until this came out, we thought the subacutes, which were regenerating, were a better indication than the hyperacute. So you need to remember, this is the, the point I was making earlier on as well. When patients recover spontaneously from liver disease, from, some, from liver failure, acute liver failure, again, the hyperacutes will recover much more rapidly than the subacutes because the regeneration takes place in hyperacutes much, much more rapidly than the subacutes because the subacutes, for whatever the etiology is an ongoing insult, because hyperacutes like paracetamol, the drug induced, the insult is stopped at the time the patient comes to you and there is no more on, ongoing insult. The cryptogenic group, the subacutes, 
you cannot stop the insult. It may be a virus that is going on and grumbling. So you don't stop the insult and therefore it's very difficult for these patients to recover spontaneously. And if it is a viral unknown illness, even post-transplant, they may not recover that rapidly compared to the hyperacute, which is the point that I made earlier on. So then came a number of publications which really put the nail to the coffin of these, um, these, these, uh, the appalled really for the auxiliary liver transplant. First is the Kyoto group. Kyoto group is one of the most respected of groups. Kyoto people were the people who started doing living donor liver transplant. It wasn't really the Koreans. It was the Japanese who started living donor liver transplant. Six patients with acute liver failure, auxiliary liver transplant, all died. So when somebody like that with such experience comes and says, this is not a good operation, people would be scared of doing it. And, and they did it for a various indication. That's one of the problem. Really, I mean, I, I know Professor Tanaka very well. We've, I've worked very closely with him, even in the early days. In fact, he came to us and had a discussion with us and went back and started doing all of this for various indications and landed up with a lot of problem. Now, in Europe, you know Andre Bismuth's unit, which is one of the most respected units, the unit for really HPB surgery. They did five cases, three genera regenerated. Among them, one died of neurological injury and two are alive with neurological sequelae. So that is again a big problem for everybody that auxiliary liver transplant is actually not a good, good operation. But what have we done? Why is it that we have got better results? So this is the largest, largest series in the world. Um, or oh, I've said more than 50% of the series of the world. 64 patients for 630 acute liver failure transplants. So King's College Hospital, I mean, this is data from two years ago, really. In King's College Hospital, we have done 630 at that time liver transplants for acute liver failure. Only 10% of them actually were suitable. But then again, in the early days, we didn't do many auxiliary liver transplant. You you'd do very few. So annually, you're talking about doing about um, three to five auxiliary liver transplants a year in a population, a large population of patients. So it's important to understand who these, who these patients will be suitable are. And the majority were adults. Now etiology, seronegative hepatitis, because we believed that seronegative hepatitis was a better indication than paracetamol overdose. And the other reason why even, if you look at the general indication, this indication would be reversed really in patients who are having transplants for acute liver failure. The reason is paracetamol overdose in UK is probably slightly more common than the seronegative hepatitis an indication, but the hyperacute patients are extremely sick. You put them on a table, you want to do an you want to do a quick autotopic transplant. You don't want to be messing around with doing a hepatectomy and an eight hour operation instead of a four hour operation, which is the autotopic liver transplant. And that's that's one of the difficulties because we didn't understand that these patients do that well. Hepatitis B was an indication. We've got Sanjeev Seigal sitting here who wrote the paper on auxiliary liver transplant for acute hepatitis B with me, I think. And then drug-induced autoimmune. When I did the, one of the autoimmunes, the hepatologist really jumped on me and said I did the biggest um, blunder of my life trying to do an auxiliary liver transplant for an autoimmune liver disease. But that patient, other than steroids, is actually off immunosuppression. Mushroom poisoning is one. So what do we do? I'm just going to describe what we do is just do protocol biopsies at three months, six months, and 12 months, and do CT volumetry and guided biopsy of the donor liver and the native liver, and do HIDA scan, and then start withdrawing immunosuppression when we know that some element of regeneration has taken place. The first point to say is when we talk to living donors, we say most regeneration happens within the first four weeks. In auxiliary liver transplant, regeneration does not take place for six months, for 12 months, for two years. The reason why regeneration does not take place in auxiliary liver transplant is you've given them a huge mass of liver to support them and there is no stimulus for regeneration of the native liver until you stop damaging the graft. Until then, you won't see regeneration. So I've heard people, there was a French paper which said we transplanted auxiliary liver transplant in an acute liver failure and the patient developed hepatic artery thrombosis on day four and day five 
we removed the auxiliary transplant and the patient survived and the patient was supported by this graft for five days and he survived. I got up and said that patient did not need a, a liver transplant if you'd removed the graft in five days. So from our experience, we know that the native livers do not regenerate as rapidly, particularly when you've given them a graft. So an example of a HIDA scan, the desider scan, this is 10 days after surgery. This is a left-sided graft. The native liver is very, the native liver has got no function. No, majority of the function is coming from the graft. You can see the excretion of the radionucleotide into the root loop. Seven months later, usually it should have been six months. In this case, it's seven months. You got nearly equal function between the right and left lobe. Now, when you get nearly equal function is when you start actually withdraw immunosuppression. If you don't get equal function, you can really try a little bit of lowering immunosuppression. If you start lowering immunosuppression at this point to stimulate regeneration, you would get a hyperacute rejection. If you get a rejection and hepatic artery thrombosis, you will lose the graft before regeneration takes place. Because if you start withdrawing immunosuppression at this point, you've got the safety of 50% liver function from the native liver. You can ask if there is 50% liver function in the native liver, it's be like doing a hepatectomy, 50% hepatectomy, the patient will be okay. I think the patients may be okay. The idea is to actually avoid doing a hepatectomy in these patients. If you slowly withdraw immunosuppression, and this is one year later, the left lobe, which is a graft, has completely disappeared. And you can, once this is completely disappeared, you can stop immunosuppression completely. And here is an example of a patient 20 months later with absolutely no regeneration at all. So in this instance, you've got to assume that this patient has had an autotopic transplant, not an auxiliary liver transplant. You forget about it this being an auxiliary liver transplant and think about it as an autotopic and carrying on, carry on with it. And a serial CT scan, this is a left auxiliary transplant and the right lobe's regenerated. They, they, we don't have the earlier CTs. You start withdrawing immunosuppression. In this patient, the patient thrombosed the artery because of rejection. You've got an abscess there which was aspirated and you've got rudimentary left lateral segment which has got hardly any vascularity and it's gradually disappeared. So I think we've had about uh, six patients where we've had to go back and remove the graft which rejected rapidly and necrosed and patient was sick with fevers, recurrent fevers. We have had to go and remove the graft in some patients. So you need to think about that. Histology of acute liver failure. Why do acute hyperacutes recover more rapidly? I mean, one of the reasons is the etiology I said, whatever is the cause is not removed. And here is, I hope all of you know, a, a lobule, a central vein, a massive necrosis. This part is only replaced with the hepatocytes. You have these peripheral hepatocytes. If on histology you find that there are surviving hepatocytes around the portal tract, those would be good patients for regeneration and they will rapidly regenerate. And you can see there is rapid repopulation. That's the central venule. And the repopulation usually happens around the portal tract because the nutrition is much better in the portal tract. The blood supply is better in the portal tract because the flow of arterial ice in the portal blood starts at the portal tract and goes to the central venue. And you can see the regeneration is better. And this actually, and, and, and as, you, as you all know, this can actually become completely normal architecture other than really some flimsy fibrosis in some regions. If you look at a Yosemin H&E section, you wouldn't even know that this liver had hardly 10% of the hepatocytes. Now, if you, the overall survival of the 64 patients was 80% survival, and this is more than 10 year follow up. This is not, one year survival would have been much higher. This includes the two patients who died at 2,819 days and 1,505 days. One was a suicide and one was a sepsis due to, that was a hepatitis B patient who had a recurrence who died of sepsis five years later. So the results are not bad. People say, why do you want to do this? The results are not better than autotopic liver transplant. We don't do this operation to improve the results. The bonus for this operation is actually withdrawal of immunosuppression. If you can demonstrate safety of the operation and safety should be equivalent result to an autotopic liver transplant, 
it is as good an operation. And we have very clearly demonstrated that it is a safe operation to do. And there were 20 children, three died with 85% survival. The adult results were not as good as uh, the pediatric results. And I'll tell you the reasons why. The first five years, if you look at the results, we only we had a 43% mortality. In the subsequent, when we have learned about, not it's not about learning the technique, I'm going to go to about learning the disease process, which has actually changed our understanding. It's not the technique. So in the, the subsequent years, there were four deaths out of 43, only a 10% mortality. And today I can confidently say we can do this operation by proper selection with 10% mortality rather than the 40% mortality in the early days. Now in the early days, what we did not understand, and you have to remember, this is an era before living donor liver transplantation came. We did not understand small fossa syndrome. So when we got a patient with acute liver failure and we are leaving behind the right lobe or an extended right lobe, we automatically thought that the right lobe had some cells, otherwise the patient shouldn't be alive. So our understanding of acute liver failure was the right side's got maybe 10% of the cells. So we'll put a left lateral segment and then that will be enough for the patient to recover. And that was very wrong. That's very wrong. Only now we retrospectively think about it and know all of these patients really died of small fossa syndrome. A small fossa, small size graft in acute liver failure is really a bad news. So half of the patients died of small fossa syndrome. And, and it was a left lateral segment and then we moved on to the left lobe. It's only when we moved on to the left lobe and then now to the right lobe, we are getting immediate survival. So that was one big learning curve that... In acute liver failure, when you want to transplant, you have to give them adequate liver cell mass for them to survive, and it has to be exactly the same amount as you would do an autotopic liver transplant. Do not rely on background surviving hepatocytes in the native liver that you're leaving behind. That was the first lesson we learned, and we already get better survival. And this is just to show about small fasciitis syndrome. Second, this is the first lesson we learned. The small size is, a, is, is actually a, a lesson which was a retrospective lesson learned. This is a patient with paracetamol overdose. And this was the first auxiliary we did, really. And this is uh, auxiliary heterotopic, not autotopic, because the patient's whole liver is still there. We put it underneath it, and the patient died was a picture of a small fasci syndrome. You can understand, because this liver is not adequate to for a patient to survive of an auxiliary liver graft. And we did a laparotomy five days later or a week later. You can see the right lobe, that is the, right, the whole liver. The graft expanded enormously. So our first understanding immediately of looking at it is this liver is regenerating rapidly and there is no adequate, the, the hepatic vein, which is under there, anastomos, has to have an outflow obstruction and this looks like an outflow obstruction. So that was the, our first understanding. Actually, it wasn't an outflow obstruction. Histologically, when you look back, it wasn't an outflow obstruction. It was actually a small fasci syndrome because this liver is desperately trying to regenerate and getting large and is becoming cholestatic and septic. And the lesson learned was that you have to do in adults a right auxiliary transplant. In children, you don't have to do a right auxiliary transplant and you cannot do a right auxiliary transplant. Why? Children are small, have got a small body cavity. Donors are always adults, whether it's cadaver or live donor, it's always adult. A right lobe of an adult won't fit into the right-sided body cavity of a child. So you have to do either a left lobe or a left lateral segment. The other thing about children is a left lateral segment implanted into a child is usually adequate as an orthotopic graft itself. The graft recipient weight ratio would be more than 1%. So the point to remember is you don't need to worry about any of these, what I've said for children. Always go and do a left lateral auxiliary liver transplant in children, which is the most straightforward to do. You would get a bet better outcome, and that's what we got as well. Even in the early days, we got a better outcome in children because there was no small fasci syndrome. But we got a better outcome in adults only after doing a right auxiliary liver transplant. So if you look at individually the adults and children, that this is the overall 
including the early, early deaths really, eight early deaths, only two late deaths with the right lobe graft, but these were the left lobe grafts with a higher mortality, but still you could have complete withdrawal of immunosuppression in a two-thirds of the patient, some regeneration which was very slow in really 75% of the patients. So it is still worth doing auxiliary liver transplants in adults. And this children is actually published in the Annals of Surgery in 2009. You got an 85% survival with, again, regeneration seen in 82% of the patients. I mean, at the time of the study, 65 were completely off immunosuppression. You would hope that with time, 80% of these children will be off immunosuppression. And children coming off immunosuppression is very important because long-term immunosuppression, renal, risk of uh, PTLD, all of that is eliminated. And also, children have a particular problem of really non-compliance when they are young, young adults or in their teenage, teenage um, because particularly acute liver failure, acute liver failure children who have transplantation have no memory of their transplant. They don't know they've been unwell. They come into hospital, they're unconscious, they have a transplant, and having the medication is actually a burden for them. So whenever you do a transplant with acute liver failure in young children, immunosuppression is a burden. If they've been sick children, they have a transplant, at least they understand they will become sick again if they don't take the medication. Now, this is important data, which Alberto Quaglia is one of our pathologists, who looked into histology of auxiliary liver transplant. And that has given us additional lessons, really. Now, he's demonstrated, he doesn't know the clinical picture we see. He only sees livers that are removed. And actually, that is so exciting that a pathologist looks at it and comes up with different description, which really fits, up, fits with the clinical description we see. So he described, he used the term diffuse type, MAP-like, and then those with no hepatocytes at all. So the, those with no surviving hepatocytes, when you did an auxiliary liver transplant, didn't regenerate at all. I don't know, if you waited long enough, they do. So the first thing he described was a diffuse type. I mean, any of you looking at this would say, this is hyperacute. This is paracetamol overdose. So you'd look at a cut section. It's actually looking very, very uniform. And if you do a histology on this, 95% of the cells would have disappeared. But the architecture is there for the regenerating cells. A few cells surviving around the portal tract will just refill the liver in no time without portal hypertension. And the next he recognized was, that's a histology, is a map like. I don't know if you can see maps of, I don't know, it doesn't look like India to me or any other country. But this is regeneration, which looks like map like regeneration. What we see on the surface or nodules is what is seen inside the liver. So this is what is seen when you cut a liver that we saw the operative picture of as a subacute liver failure. So we looked at how these, because histologically, when you do, this is what we're going to get. You do a needle biopsy, it's going to say this is a diffuse type or this is a map-like type, because particularly when you take a biopsy in the region of what you see as regeneration. And we could, he could say, Majority of the MAP-like, I mean, the diffuse type were paracetamol overdose. Majority of the MAP-like were seronegative hepatitis. I would have said that to him, even without him cutting the liver to tell me what it is. By looking at a liver, I would have said that to him. And we looked, at, looked to see the results of the diffuse type and the MAP-like variety. And actually, the diffuse type, I mean, sorry, the, the results are not there. I don't know whether well the slide won't. The diffuse type actually did better than the MAP-like type which were actually regenerating. In fact, they were large regenerating nodules. Again, just to reinforce the point that I made earlier on. I think I'll conclude here. Auxiliary liver transplant is safe, as safe as a whole liver transplant replacement, and we, have, we, have, we, have, we can do that now, and you, you could even do it safer. Children regenerate better. I think it should be offered for children whenever it is possible, because most often it's only a left lateral segment and you implant a left lateral segment into the center of the abdomen, the right side is not occupied anyway in children, and the native liver is going to quietly sit there. Complete regeneration in seeds. In every patient who survived who had a transplant for paracetamol overdose, the auxiliary liver transplant completely regenerated. So hyperacutes 
in contrast to what we taught earlier on, are the best indication for auxiliary liver transplant. And really, the selection should be based on the quality of the organ. In India, quality of the organ is not an issue because majority of them are living down liver transplant. And then the hemodynamic stability and the neurological complication at the time of surgery. And histology independently can make the same decision as the surgeons can make. Thank you very much. Any burning questions? One question allowed. Uh, Doctor, it was absolutely delightful talk, uh, a clinical, pathological, a conceptual talk, I must say, and really thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, my uh, simple question to you is that uh, now, uh, what is the practicality of use of uh, APOLT in an LDLT setup? You think that we can actually uh, utilize this expertise? You have so Very much, much so. We have done three APOLTs in Chennai. Yeah. In an ALF situation, I mean, because, uh, I mean, uh, we have not been able to, you know, actually do it in a, uh, 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 Dr. Gupta mentioned he was. I know, I it's, it's very daunting. You know, it's easy to take a liver out and put a new liver in and then get out of there. You know, and you've done a donor hepatectomy and then you have to do a recipient partial hepatectomy and then you have to implant the liver as well. It is difficult, but you have to jump into it to, to be able to do. And the best patients are probably children with good hemodynamic stability should be able to do it. I, I, I think um, you've, you've done it. Um, it's been done, not just by me. You want to say something? Yeah, no. It's the uh, hemodynamic stability finally <laughs> which would decide, I mean basically you have to decide whether the patient is stable enough to undergo a hepatectomy in that setting. Am I right? Is that the only thing that really dissuades you from doing a... Yeah, but that, that probably is one of the important factors because you've got a very unstable patient on the table. Um, we generally said in the past, toxic liver syndrome is an issue. The SERS is an issue. SERS is an issue because most of the liver is necrotic and to leave a necrotic liver behind and to do an auxiliary may be a worry. But I have to say, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced about it. I don't know if the clinical picture of an acute liver failure is because of the presence of a dead liver or absence of liver cell mass. So if you say to me that it is the presence of a dead liver that produces a clinical picture of acute liver failure rather than absence, maybe it's a combination of the two. I don't even know because actually, I thought somebody will immediately jump and say it is actually the dead liver that produces the picture because we know that when you do a total hepatectomy on these patients, they would, rem they would recover for a short period of time. Maybe it has a combination, so you may, you may have, I mean, we keep saying dead liver. They are actually not a necrotic liver like a necrotic limb. It's not, it's a vascularized organ with cells which are not there. It, it really is a wrong word to use as a necrotic liver. If you remember, if you do a CT scan on a liver which has collapsed from acute liver failure, it will look bright. It will look bright because it's very arterialized. The blood that is going through the liver, through the arterial system, takes a shortcut into the venous system, and therefore <laughs> it's re really looking hyperemic. They are not actually necrotic livers. It's the dead cells with, with the cytokines released which causes that. It's very different, actually, to a limb ischemia, for instance, where everything is dead and you're trying to reperfuse it. So well, that was a very great, uh, good session. Thanks a lot, Dr. Rela. We'll close the session here. Uh, thank you very much. I request the chairpersons to please give a memento to all our speakers. Uh, Dr. Subhash Gupta, Dr. Sanjeev Sangal, Dr. Khakkar, and Professor Rela, please.
Thank you very much. I request uh, uh, the chairperson to please defeat the film a momento. Uh, Dr. Demon, please.